hello and welcome. Um, this is a program called In the Interest of Humanity, and I'm your host, uh, Alaji Irbad Ibrahim from Ghana in West Africa. Sometimes people keep wondering, how do we break the jinx of generational poverty in Africa? In most third world countries on this continent and elsewhere, you'll find out that if you are poor today, chances are your dad was poor. Chances are your grandfather was poor and chances are the parents of your grandparents were also poor. And if you don't adopt the right mechanisms and don't get things right and learn from the mistakes of two or three generations before you, then chances are, unfortunately, your kids will be poor, your kids' kids will be poor, and your great-grandchildren will be poor as well. That is because in Africa, we glorify poverty. In Africa, we shy away from carrying out, you know, business ideas that would last generations. Show me a single rich person on the continent whose father was rich and the father's father was rich. Many African business moguls are one-offs. I don't want to give examples, but look around you. In whichever country you are watching me currently, look around you. Look at five rich people in your own vicinity. And you realize that these are one-offs. An African who has gone into politics and has made so much money in so little time. And chances are the person's father was a poor person. Or an African who has gone into ministry is a pastor or an imam that has, you know, um, built a fortune out of a ministry. Or an African who is a one-off in terms of a business, a knack for business or an idea uh, that reaches fruition and the person is a six or seven digit uh, salary earner uh, currently. It is a rarity on the African continent to find wealth handed down generations. And the time has come for us to break away from the norm, to break away from the convention that Africa only deserves one of rich people. Our wealth should be generational. Uh, so you become successful as a business person, you form a family-owned business, your son takes over, or your cousin takes over, or somebody within the family takes over. The person hands down that business knack generations after you. But unfortunately, this is a novelty for us on the continent. And I believe no matter how small the business is, you can turn it into a family business that can grow generation after generation. Are you into cocoa production? Are you into share butter production? Do you operate a little factory anywhere on the African continent? How do we take away the individualism and create a business conglomerate that is owned by a family and then last generations? Many of the successful companies around the world are not one-off companies. These are well thought through family businesses that have survived the vagaries of the stock markets and have done so well over the past few decades. I'll show you a few of them. I'll discuss a few of them. And unfortunately, none of them comes from the African continent because on, on this continent, we don't create generational wealth. We create generational poverty. Number one on my list is Novartis. Novartis. Novartis is a big company that is into the healthcare delivery industry. It is located in Switzerland and it has a market cap of 279 billion US dollars. How many countries have a GDP of 200 billion dollars? But this is a family business and its net worth or cap Market cap is 279 billion US dollars, and the family is called the Sandoz family. Novartis is one of the world's biggest drug makers, not hard drugs, 
by the pharmaceutical company uh, products. It was created in 1996 after the merger between Sandoz and Siba Geiji. Today, the descendants of Edward Sandoz, that is where, you know, the family bit comes in. Edward Sandoz, who founded Sandoz in 1886. How on earth does a company that is almost two centuries old, 1886, 1986, in 1986, it marked, it, it marked a centenary. In 1986, it was a century old. And now from 86 up to this time, it is soon going to be 150 years old, one and a half centuries. This man, Edward Santos, who founded Sandoz in 1886, Owns a, owned a substantial amount of Novartis shares. The Santos Family Foundation is the company's single largest shareholder and its president, Pierre Landolt, sits on Novartis' board of directors. That is how you make families happen. That is how you make families generationally wealthy. But on this continent, for, for as long as you were born to a you are born to a poor father. Chances are he was also born to a poor father. You are also going to give birth to poor children. How do we break away uh, from this cyclical, you know, uh, spell of poverty? Then, second on my list is Roche. Roche is also into the healthcare delivery industry. It's also a company based in Switzerland and has a market cap of $254 billion. And the family that owns it is the Hoffman Ori family. Fritz Hoffman Laroche founded a cough syrup company that today develops some of the best cancer drugs in the world. His hairs still control at least half of the company's bearer shares, according to Bloomberg. The Hoffman Ori family controls the company through their voting pool. The family has at least eight billionaires, eight billionaires, including Dr. Andreas Ori and Andre Hoffman, who both sit on the drug makers board of directors. That is how you hand down generational wealth. So a family should not boast of poor people. I'm sorry to say this, in some African families, you can have up to 50 members of the family that can't even afford three square meals. It's a generational poverty we are handing down. And the time has come for us to, you know, change the way we look at families. How do we establish successful families? How do we start up businesses that will last generations? And third on the list is Walmart. Walmart is a popular brand around the world. Walmart is into consumer staples and it is located in the United States. It has a market cap of $241 billion and it is owned by the Walton family. And for anybody who has been to the United States, for every corner you turn, you either see a Walmart or a McDonald's or you see a Walgreen. This is how you have an indelible imprint on the economy of your country. Grandparents made things happen. Their sons and daughters continue the success story and grandchildren come and benefit and also continue to hand over the baton of success and many generations down the line. The Walton family owns about half of Walmart through Walton Enterprises, according to Thomson Reuters data. The 50% stake is valuable enough to put five hairs among the wealthiest people in the world. Five hertz, people who are benefiting from the estate and business savvy and knack of grandparents and fathers. 
So if you want people who are at the table of men, rich men in the world, the Walton family that owns Walmart can present up to five people. How many African families can boast of two rich people that can compete in the international or on the international market? It's a rarity. It's very rare. And we need to start thinking along those lines of creating generational wealth rather than generational poverty. Brothers, Rob and Jim Walton sit on the company's board of directors. You will call the shots. If you own a family business, you will call the shots. And along with Sister Alice, who is sister-in-law to Christy, each has a net worth hovering around 35 billion US dollars. And cousins, you know, when there is success, it goes beyond the nuclear family. And cousins and Walton uh, and Nancy Walton, Laurie, are all billionaires from their company shares. Rob Walton's son-in-law, you see how, you know, successful businesses can go beyond the family and include other people. Getting even married to a member of the, that family opens you up to success. Rob Walton's son-in-law, Gregory Penner, succeeded him as Walton's chairman last month. So that is how you create generational wealth. Fourth on the list is Facebook. Did, were you thinking that Mark Zuckerberg would make this a one-off company? Successful families don't think that way. When you are successful, you rope in the whole of the family so the business can last generations. Uh, Facebook, which I'm using, I'm not using Facebook, I'm recorded on a different, you know, platform, but soon this will be published on Facebook. Um, it is in the, Facebook is in the information technology industry, is located in the United States, and it, it has a market cap of $225 billion, and the family is the Zuckerberg family. Mark Zuckerberg has brought his family into his Facebook empire, which he still owns just under one third of. His older sister, Randy, was a marketing executive at the company before leaving to start her own firm. Zuckerberg also gave his father 2 million shares of Facebook stock to thank him for providing him with some money during the company's earliest years. That is how families make things happen. Show me a single African company that has lasted three, four or five generations. Because we are individualistic in the way we look at things, because our vision is, uh, sorry to say, myopic, we don't think beyond 50 years. It's all about me and my immediate family members being okay, going for luxury vacations. We don't think in the long term to create generational wealth. What we hand down on this African continent to our progeny is generational poverty. And we need to break away from that, uh, that cycle. Then there is also uh, a company, and Husser Butch Imbu is a, is a Belgian company. It's also into consumer staples and is owned by the Lehman Sikopira Teles family. And private equity group 3G Capital was behind the 2008 merger, merger, merger that led to the creation of this company. And it has quite a difficult name, ABI. Today, 3G principal George Polo Lemon, Brazil's richest man, is the brewer's largest shareholder. His parents, Carlos Sicupira and Marcel Herman, also hold large stakes in the company. Together, the three men own 26% of the company, and Lemon and Telles sit on the board of directors. So your family will own the business, own or own the biggest or largest shares and still call the shots by sitting on top of the company. Number six is Oracle. 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 
Oracle. It's also into the information technology before Facebook, before um, Twitter, before YouTube. There were some precursors uh, to this giant, you know, success in, in IT across the world. There was Oracle, there was MySpace, and a host of others. Oracle is in the United States, and it has a market cap of 192 billion US dollars, and it's owned by the Ellison family. Larry Ellison is still chairman and chief technology officer of the software company that helped make him America's third richest man. He stepped down as CEO in September of 2014 while his children, while his children, Megan and David, both hold Oracle stock. It's unlikely that, yes, while his children, while his children. So if you are a father, what are you handing down to your sons and daughters? Are you handing down generational poverty or creating opportunities for them to, to thrive? Then number seven is Samsung Electronics. Did you know that Samsung Electronics is also a family-owned business? People mean business. They are creating generational wealth. Africa should learn pluck important pages from that playbook and create a generational wealth. Samsung Electronics is also into the information technology uh, industry. It is a company in South Korea. Samsung is a South Korean company and it has a market cap of 174 billion US dollars. And the family that owns it is a Lee family. Lee Hong He helped grow his father's company, Samsung Group, into a global conglomerate. He is chairman of the flagship business, Samsung Electronics, while his son, his own son, his son, for God's sake, his son. On this continent, your father is poor. Chances are you will be poor. Chances are your children are going to be poor. No creation of generational wealth. What we create is generational poverty. While his son, an expected successor, G.Y. Lee, is vice chairman, and his daughters, Bo Jin and Sean Hung, I don't know how these words are pronounced or names, also hold executive roles within the firm. In 2014, a judge dismissed the suit from Lee Hun His siblings, all urging that these he stole Samsung shares that they were supposed to inherit from their father. A lot of family issues, but this still remains a family business. Then there is Volkswagen, the producer of VW cars, the German machine. Did you know that this is also a family business? This is into the automobile industry. They call it, the categorization they've given it is consumer discretionary. And it is in Germany. It is in Germany, Europe. And Volkswagen, uh, VW, has a market cap of 120 billion US dollars. And the family that owns it is Piet Porsche. I don't know whether I'm getting the pronunciation of the name right. Many members of the Piet Porsche family together hold the majority stake in Volkswagen through their Porsche automobile holding company. The Piet Porsche are descendants of Porsche founder Ferdinand Porsche, who was also a Nazi party member and designed the first VW for Adolf Hitler. He designed the first VW for Adolf Hitler. Today, at least five family members sit on the board of Volkswagen. Volkswagen brands include Porsche, Audi, and Bentley. This is a family business. So for rich folks that are sitting in a Bentley, you are patronizing a family business. And those sitting in a Porsche, a Porsche, you are, you know, you are patronizing a family business. 
Why does it have to come from Europe and America all the time? Why is it that in Africa we only create generational poverty? We don't create generational wealth. And then there is a Kinder Morgan family. The Kinder Morgan family. They are into energy, the energy industry. This business is also located in the United States and has a market cap of 90 billion US dollars. And the family that owns it is a Kinder family. After leaving Enron, Richard Kinder co-founded Kinder Morgan in 1997. With a massive portfolio of oil and gas pipelines, the company is one of the largest of its kind in the world. Kinder and his wife, Nancy, are major Houston philanthropists through their Kinder Foundation. So the family builds a business empire, becomes economically self-sufficient, and the poor and needy, the sick and the disabled, get to benefit through philanthropy. How on earth is this rocket science for African families to do? So let's learn to create generational wealth to benefit the rest of society. Then number 10 is Nike. Did you know that Nike is a family business? Nike is also consumer discretionary and is based in the United States and has a market cap of 82.2 billion US dollars and it is owned by the Knight family. Phil Knight has been the face of the iconic Nike brand since he co-founded the company in 1964. How many of us have not ever kicked a Nike during our days as teenagers? And this business has been there since 1964. Just last month, Nike announced that Knight will step down from his role as chairman in 2016. Uh, uh, in, in, he, he stepped down in 2016. And his son, Travis Knight, will take a seat on the board to continue the family's legacy at the company. Generational wealth, business ideas handed down from father to son, from grandfather to father rather than generational poverty, which we have in most parts of Africa. Then I'll mention one or two more uh, companies, then I call it a wrap. Um, I want to mention a brand that is known to people. There are so many other family businesses we don't know about, but they are doing fairly well. Then, um, okay, I want to mention a brand that is known to most people. Maybe that will be the last I will mention. Yes. Carnival Corporation. Not too popular, not too known to many people. Uh, Carnival Corporation. It's based in the U.S. and has a market cap of 37 billion U.S. dollars and is owned by the Harrison Arison family. Siblings Mickey and Sherry Arison both hold large stakes in Carnival, the cruise ship operator founded by their late father, Ted. Mickey is chairman and a former CEO of Carnival and also owns the Miami Heat. Shari has her own investment firm in Israel and is one of the richest people in the Middle East. So in conclusion, what I have to say is, God Almighty did not put us on this African continent that has a rich, fertile, and arable land for us to be poor. You see, the providence and favors of Allah are just like rainfall. When rain falls from the skies, it doesn't discriminate. I just came from another part of the world. When rain falls, it just falls. It's water that falls from the sky. It doesn't deprive Africa. It doesn't deprive any continent. It doesn't deprive any family. 
it doesn't deprive any group of people. Rain just falls. Our Creator Allah, or God Almighty, makes rain fall. Those that are visionary would want to fix their bucket or lay pipes so that the water can get to them at their own convenience. But those that don't lay pipes would have to walk a mile or more to the riverside before they can get a bucket of water. So the time has come for Africa to realize and for us as Africans to realize that poverty is a choice. When you are poor, and especially if that poverty is generational, if your great grandfather was poor, then your grandfather did not learn from the mistakes of your great grandfather. That was why he ended poor. If your great grandfather was poor and your grandfather ended up poor, maybe your grandfather did not learn from the mistakes of your great grandfather. If your father is poor today, maybe he didn't learn from the mistakes of his father. If you and I are poor today, then maybe we are not learning from the mistakes of our own fathers. So let's learn as a continent to end generational poverty and create generational wealth so that we will lift our people up from the doldrums of economic woes and to a pedestal of dignified life. Thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye.